So <clears throat> we are supposed to have about three of you guys in this class, so we'll just hold tight for a little bit longer just to see if they show up. Okay, so that's everyone. So let's go ahead and get things started here. So a couple of things before we um, fully start uh, here today. Um, number one, uh, just want to check, um, making sure uh, none of you guys, none of you guys have taken this class before me with me, right? Um, I don't recognize any of you guys' names, but um, just making sure because <clears throat> because um. This is going to be like a full, like fully from the start all over again um, type of class. So what that means is I'll be going through all the material all over again. What that means is like if you um, if you've been in this class before, then, you know, you'll be hearing all the same things, all, you know, once again, which, you know, if you need it, sure. But uh, otherwise um, might not be as helpful. Right. Um, so just making sure that. Uh, this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't like the second time any of you guys are taking this class. Um, but yeah, so, uh, I guess to kind of kick things off here, I, I should start by kind of explaining what I, what I plan on in this class. So this class will go over the, um, the SAT math 63 tips, uh, tips and tricks. Um, the idea here is, um, we're going to be spending a couple of classes going through the actual, um, going through the actual tips themselves um so we'll we'll be going through the 63 different parts and talking about um you know about the different uh types of questions that you'll see on the sat and um kind of like where you'll learn about each of that material um if there's anything that you're not familiar with um you know at the time uh let me know and then i'll explain it a little bit more in detail um but for the most part i'm not going to spend too much time on any one piece and the reason for that is, you know, this is like an, you know, this is an SAT level class, right? I'm not here to fully teach you the material. That would take, you know, hours and hours per subject, right? Um, so I'm not here to fully teach you everything behind the material. I'm just here to teach you, uh, in this class at least, right, the actual, um, the, the single concepts that you know tend to be, uh, tend to be on parts of exams, right? Um. And then as we do uh, individual questions, as we do individual problems, I'll show you guys some little, you know, shortcuts that you guys can use uh, that will make uh, that will make your life a little bit easier. Um, and th that will be, you know, that, that'll be some of the things that we'll look at um, in more of the practice exam sections. Right. So the start of this, uh, the start of this class, right, the first uh, couple of weeks, I um, probably around the first eight weeks, I would say. Um, will probably be um just me going through one two three four yeah so it'll be mostly just me going through um the actual tips themselves we'll split that up into uh, around eight different sections and it will go through um and then uh once that is done we'll go through the practice exams bit by bit um so I think uh if I a general idea of like where you guys all are in um in mathematics that would be really helpful so if you don't mind um could you guys let me know like what level of mathematics you guys have completed um and you guys can either just send that in the chat or you know like you can send that directly to me um 
that would be great. Um, but just let me know. And then th that's like just a little bit helpful for me to have a general idea of where everyone stands. Um, I guess like apart from that, um, oh, uh, so the SAT, uh, the SAT, uh, exam for the most part typically, uh, does, uh, typically goes up to an, an algebra two level. So if you're in algebra two right now, or you uh, have completed algebra two, then um, you should have learned everything already for the actual SAT material. Um, so it really just comes down to, uh, really just comes down to how well you remember and all the different, you know, formulas that you'll need. Looks like for the most part, most of you guys are pretty far into uh, mathematics. So this will, this should go a lot faster than some of my like, prior, uh, prior times teaching this class at least. Okay, so um, apart from that, uh, just a little bit about like my teaching style, I suppose. Um, I don't like just giving you guys answers. I don't like, you know, just sitting here and talking for like an hour, hour and a half at a time, right? I don't want to do that, right? Um, because I think number one, uh, it just means that you're just watching me. Um, and I don't think that's, uh, you know, I don't think that makes for good um retention right because i think uh if i you know ask you guys to work things out ask you guys to help out with problems it'll be better for you guys and you know how well you remember things right um if i make you guys work for things instead of giving them straight to you i think uh you know you'll have a better idea of how things work so for that reason um i plan on asking you guys to help me out with problems um what that means is i'll be asking you guys to work out problems um you know kind of like for me and then I'll comment on them once you're done, right? Um, if you don't want to answer any questions, right, just let me know. Um, if for any reason you can't or would rather not, right, just send me a message or something. Like, let me know that you don't want to answer any questions. It's fine. I'm not going to force you to participate, right? I can't force you to, to participate. But um, I have found that typically uh, students who do, right, tend to tend to learn more, I think. Um, so yeah, um, apart from that, if you run into any questions, um, for the most part, I'll typically be, you know, stopping around and asking if anyone has any questions. Sometimes I'll forget, but uh, if I do forget, um, either just raise your hand or, um, you can either raise your hand or, uh, you know, just, um, type it out in the chat or something like that. And I'll make sure to call on you or, you know, answer as soon as I can. Um, but yeah, that's really about it. I mean, lastly, just like if you need to use the restroom or go for any reason, right? Just just go. Um, just let me know you're gone. Um, but please, right? I'm not gonna stop you. Just go. Well, that's pretty much about it. So let's go ahead and get things started here with the first couple of tips here in this in this um book. So the first couple of tips in this book all cover for the most part just functions. And the general idea here is that is a topic that you learn about in algebra one, right? So um, the most basic function that you're going to talk about is a linear function. And that's what that's where we are going to start. So linear functions or just lines, as you may have learned about them before, right? Um, these can be written in a couple of different formats, but the most common three formats are as follows. Number one, you have slope intercept form. It's named slope intercept form because it, you know, the format contains exactly both of those, right? Both the slope and the intercept in terms of M and B. You have point slope form in which you have one of the points that's on the line, X1, Y1 being X, X1 here, Y1 here, and then M being your slope. So again, right, it's named after the two pieces of, two pieces of information that you're given. And then you have general form, which isn't really common and standard form, which is the more common one. One really important detail about standard form is in order for it to be considered standard form, number one, A, B, and C all have to be integers. Number two, A actually needs to be positive, and you know the rest of them can be negative, can be positive, it doesn't really matter, it depends on the question, right? But A specifically needs to be positive in order for it to be standard form. So there's not multiple different standard. Actually, I mean, to be fair, you could just multiply everything by two, right? But if you simplified it down, I suppose, 
um, you're not going to have multiple different types of standard forms uh, for the same equation, at least. So that's the general idea here. Um, the idea behind a line is that the slope, the slope between um, any two points is always consistent, right? Um, and that means that if I use this format here, this formula here, delta y over delta x, the idea is I'm always going to find the same value. This delta here, this delta sign, simply just means change in. So you're going to simply just take the difference between your y coordinate, difference between your x coordinates, and find the ratio of that. Now, one slight important detail here is it's important that you always make sure to do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, right? If you do y2 minus y1 and then do x1 minus x2, you're going to get the negative answer of your slope instead. Um, is everyone here pretty familiar with this? Um, do I need to explain what slope or anything like this means? Is anyone here un is this is this the first time anyone of you guys is seeing um a linear function? Everyone's good? Okay. In that case, then let's take a look at some of these problems and let's see if there's maybe some faster ways to do some of these questions as well. All right. Um, so let's start off here. And we can just start from the top. So Aaron, problem number one. Uh, do you want me to solve it? Yeah. Um, so oh, okay. if you would just start by reading the problem. Um, the reason why I okay. asked um, you guys to read the problems is because this way I can just make sure that you understand the, understand the notation as well. Um, so yeah, if you could start by reading the problem and you don't have to read the answer choices, but after that, just kind of explain how you would solve it. And then we'll go from there, okay? Uh, for a linear function f, f of zero equals two and f of three equals five, if k equals f of five, what is the value of k? Mm -hmm. And then uh, first I would find the slope by taking the coordinates. So it's mm -hmm. uh, the first one is zero, two, and then the second one is three, five. Yeah. And then I would plug it into the slope formula. So five minus two is three, and then three minus zero is three. Mm -hmm. And then so the slope is one. Uh huh. And then and then so if you put it into a slope intercept form, it's just x plus. Two and so you plug in five for x and an x plus two is seven. Yeah. Or five plus two is seven. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much about it, right? So the idea here, right? Um, if you're told that f of zero is equal to two, that simply just means, right? F of x is equal to y. So your x coordinate is equal to zero here. Your y is equal to well two, right? So at that point, you know, okay, this gives me um a coordinate, and then from there you're able to find the rest of your information, right? Well, you take that coordinate and this coordinate, plug it in into your slope formula, right? Subtract away and you get your answers here. Um, right, and then it's, it is important, right, just to make sure that your same coordinate is lined up vertically, right? Okay, looks good to me. Any questions here from anyone? There is a little bit that you could have done faster here. For example, you could have, instead of going through all of this to find everything, right? Uh, a shortcut here would have been to say, look at look at the changes here, look at the changes here, right? The changes match, right? Um, the ratio between your x difference and your y difference is the exact same. So if you simply took go up another two to five, you would go up another two to seven, right? And that's just a little bit of a shortcut here so that you don't have to, you know, run through the whole thing. Okay, um, looks good to me. Let's look at uh, problem number two. Uh, Benjamin? Ben? Guess not. Um, Brandon then? The table above shows some values of functions f. If f is a linear function, what is value? What is the value of a plus b? Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think it's twenty four. Okay, and how so? So then, um, uh, so like X is like an input, and F mm -hmm. is an output. Yeah. So then, if one time, so then I mean one times F is equal to twelve. Then that means F is equal to twelve. Hmm. Okay, so first off, f of x, right, is not the same thing as f times x. That's not what this means. What f of x means, like this, right, it means it's a function of x. It means you plug in x into something and then you get an answer back. So while it is true, yes, that, you know, f of x could be equal to, you know, 12 times x, right? That's not that's not the same thing as actually saying f itself is 12. What you're thinking of is saying two separate variables being multiplied together. That's not the case here. That's not that's not what this means at all. This is a function of a number. Like if I said f of x equals, you know, x squared, if I said f of 3, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this value of 3 right here and I'm going to plug it in into the x part here. So then this would become, well, 3 squared, which is equal to 9. That's how you would solve that. So it's not it's not correct to think of this as two numbers being multiplied together. Uh, I don't really know. Who. OK. So first off, you're told that this is a linear function, right? So. If you know that this is a linear function, you know that, for example, um, f of x must be something in the format of m times x plus b. And what we know is that f of 1 is equal to, well, m plus b, which is equal to 12. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, according to our definitions, right, it's just m plus b because x is equal to 1. So what about when f is f of when you take a f of zero? What is that? What is that equal to? Um, it would be um What's the value of x here? Zero. Zero. So what's the value of x here? Zero. So m times zero plus b, right? Mm -hmm. What is that equal to? B. Mm -hmm. Because anything times zero is just zero. What about f of two? What is that equal to? M times two plus b. Mm -hmm. uh... Wait. Right, so you know that f, f of 0 is b, f of 2 is 2m plus b. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is, uh, so that, so now you know, right? Well, this b is a little bit bad because we have this b over here, so maybe let's write this as like a, maybe let's write this as like a n or something for now. Mm -hmm. The point being is this is n, this is n, right? Uh-huh. Okay, so we know that this is equal to A, we know that this is equal to B, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so don't you agree that A plus B is equal to N plus 2M plus N, right? Yeah. Okay, what's that equal to? Two M plus two N. Mm-hmm. So then A plus B is equal to two uh two M plus two N. Right, but what's that equal to? What number is that? Um, well, well you know that plus n is equal to 12 so if you have so two, then it equals 24 equal to 24 
What's the ideal here? So paying a lot of attention to the fact that it's a linear function. What you could have also done is you could have noted that, you know, if I, you know, will increase by one here, that would mean that 12 is equal to a plus, you know, well, uh, some difference, right? In this case, we can call it n, right? It means that whatever the difference is from a to 12, that difference gets applied again from 12 to b, right? So this is equal to 12 plus n in that case. So if you think about it that way, if this is a plus n, then wouldn't a just be equal to 12 minus n? So if I take those two and add together, that gives me 24 as well. That's another more easy way to solve this question, at least. Any questions here from anyone? So this problem kind of fully relies on the fact that the difference here and the difference here is the exact same. Otherwise, this problem would be a lot harder to do if not impossible. But your answer here is 24. All right, let's move on. Um, Let's take a look at problem number three, I suppose. Um, We mentioned it at the start of the class here today. I don't think you were here for that. Um, But the, the book that we're going through is this is the, uh, it's called like Dr. John Chung's SAT Math 63 Tips. Um, but, uh, we're just going through that for now. Okay. Um, next up, Edward. Uh, so are we supposed to, um, subtract three. both sides by AX and by C and then divide by B to convert to linear? Mm -hmm. Um, you could, uh, but that's a little bit hard, right? Because you're not really told what those values are. Um, but can you start by reading through the question? Okay. Now, a linear function is given by ax plus by plus c equals zero, and a is greater than zero. Wait, uh, yes, a is greater than zero, b is less than zero, and c is greater than zero. Which of the following graphs best represents the graph of the function? Okay. So your idea of basically converting this into a y equals mx plus b, that's okay, I suppose. It might help you a little bit to, you know, look through this in a bit of a way that you're more familiar with, right? And especially if you're much more familiar with the uh, slope intercept form, I agree with that, right? The idea is put it into a format that you're more comfortable with, right? And that makes sense, right? Um, but the problem with that is you don't really have any numbers, so it might seem a little bit difficult to do that. If you still want to do it, we can go ahead and do it, right? So what is that going to look like here then? Mm -hmm. So what's, what's the, what, what are you going to get first? Hold on, I just gotta write this down real quick. Okay, sure. Um, I mean, I suppose, yeah. Okay, so what you suggested was to subtract both sides by AX and C. So that becomes BY equals a, a negative AX minus C, right? And then divide both sides by B at that point. So you get Y yes. equals negative A over BX minus C over B. Does that look good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so at this point, what do we do? So, uh, B is a negative number. So, uh, A uh -huh. over B, X would be positive and then it would be plus C over B. Positive number. Okay. Um, and then you said C over B also be positive? Yes. Okay. Um, and for what reason is that? Like, how do you know specifically that both of these end up being positive? Because, um... It's minus C, and then it's divided by a negative number. Uh-huh. Yeah. Because C is positive, B is negative, which makes this part a negative, but you're subtracting a negative number, which means that it once again is positive. Okay. So at this point, once you realize that both of these are positive, um, what is your answer now? B. 
yeah. D, you said? D, one? yes. Um, and what makes you say that? Like, how do you know this is correct at this point? Because it's a positive slope and the y-intercept is positive. Yeah, so you're looking for a positive slope, so for something to go increasing as you move to the right. Um, and then you're looking for, well, a positive y-intercept, right? And that's what looks, you know, that's what you get right here. So yeah, that's uh, that's how you know that this is the correct answer. Um, you don't have to convert it here, right? Um, what you could have done is, for example, just look for, right, if a if x or y needs to be positive while the other is zero. So basically, instead of looking for, um, you know, the slope intercept form, just look for the x and y intercepts, right? So while x is equal to zero, right, b is negative, c is positive, so y would need to be negative. Sorry, why would need to be positive? Why would need to be positive, right? For this to be equal to zero, right? Because you need a negative number plus a positive number. B is already negative, C is already positive, so Y just needs to be positive. So anything with the negative value of Y as the Y intercept is already wrong. So those two are gone. And then just do the opposite, right? So if Y is equal to zero, okay, C is positive, A is positive, X needs to be negative in order for this to, you know, cancel out, right? So your answer is D. Does that make sense? So if you guys are, you know, if you guys are more familiar with, uh, you know, if you guys are more familiar with the slope intercept form, right, just go ahead and convert to that. I'm not going to say, right, don't do that. Just do whatever you need to do in order to get a question correct, right? But the idea is if you can be more familiar, more flexible with, you know, some different approaches to some of these questions, maybe you'll be able to do them faster. And that's the idea here. That's the goal. Um, let's kind of skip around here a little bit. Maybe let's do, um, number six. Let's take a look here. Number six. Uh, I think next up is, I guess, Jet. Uh, so the graph of a function f is shown in the x, y plane above if B equals 2A, what is the value of A? Mm -hmm. uh, so A would just be the middle value between 0 and 5, right? So 5 over 2? Um, But why does that make you say oh, wait. that? It just looks like it is, right? It doesn't necessarily actually mean it is. Um... Just because it looks like it, right? Doesn't mean it actually is. That's a, that's a really common issue on the SAT. Like you're gonna you're gonna have a lot of things that look a certain way or whatever, but you can't just you know can't just take it for granted, right? Um, draw. In other words, drawings are not drawn to scale, so you gotta be able to prove it. Right. Um. So would a good approach be to find the slope first? Yeah, I, it would. Okay, so then that would be negative 3 over 5. So what's the equation of this line at this point? Y equals? Y equals negative 3 over 5x plus b. Well... Wait, no, sorry. Uh, plus three. There you go. That's a lot better, right? Because also B is that in yeah. this question. So it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit not good if you use B again, right? Okay. Um, all right. Any ideas now? Um, and then if equals to a finding well maybe it would since b equals 2a you can input a as the x mm -hmm. so and then b is the y then right yeah. So like B equals negative three over five A plus three. Okay. And then from here, what can you do? And then you can 
um uh make it equal to 2a and then solve for a yeah exactly um so the reason for that is because you've been told that b is equal to 2a so you're simply just substituting substituting in the value of 2a instead of b right so then from here you can solve for the value of a pretty quickly um do you mind doing that real quick so what is that from here yeah um it's A is equal to 15 over 13. Yeah, so from here, right, what you're going to do is you're going to add the 3 over 5a to both sides. So this becomes, um, well, 13 over 15a is equal to 3, right? And you're going to, um, sorry, not 13 over 15, 13 over 5, 13 over 5. <laughs> yeah. I had to look at that for a second. Um, then from here, right, multiply both sides by 5, divide both sides by 13, you get a is equal to, as you said, 15 over 13. So your answer here is C. That's correct. That's nice right. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question or? No, no, no. Okay. So that's pretty much the general idea here. Um, you pretty much have to solve it this way. There's not really any any better way for you to do this. Um, and so again, right, just a word of warning here on like a lot of SAT questions, right? Um, you can't really just you know look at the picture and say oh that looks about halfway right I mean, as you can saw, as you can see here it wasn't right um, but yeah the general idea here right solve for the equation of the of the um, line and then once you have the equation of the line plug in um, you know your two a for your y and plug in and find what that value of x needs to be right that's pretty much about it. Um, so there's a couple of problems here that I want to do. Um, the first one is, I guess, eight and nine. They're both pretty much the same. So, um, let's see, James, eight and nine, it's your choice. Which one you want to do? If not, okay. Or something, but okay. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not like it. No worries. Um, how about Andrew? Do we have two guys, or is it just one? Because I know sometimes people like join. A... Um, like it's fifth. I like joined once and then I left because my mic wasn't working. But like for some reason, it's still there. Oh, uh, wait. You took you took this class in the summer, didn't you? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so this, with, with this like iteration of the class, we're just going to be starting over from the tips again. So, I mean, if you want to, you're, you know, you're, you're free to join for now, but otherwise you can, you can maybe like join in once we start going through the actual tests again, which will be in a couple of weeks. I don't know. I mean, I guess for today you can just keep, you know, stay here for now. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, eight and nine, I guess it's your choice which one you want to use. Uh, Andrew? <laughs> Did I lose you? Oh, no. Wait, is my mic working? Sorry. Okay, no. You're good, you're good. I guess I'll do eight. Uh, uh, Fahrenheit F and Celsius C are related by the equation above. If Fahrenheit temperature increased by 27 degrees, what is the degree increase in Celsius? Uh, I guess... Uh, Oh wait, I I I don't remember if I remember this correctly, but wasn't it like uh F over C is like 
equivalent to uh, nine over five? Um, not quite, not really F over C, because remember, there's always this flat plus 32 here. It's not exactly 9 over 5. Oh, uh, uh, Yeah, I'm not. Uh, what's it like? Do I replace F with 27? No, you don't. I mean, so one of the important things here is the question says the Fahrenheit temperature increased by 27 degrees. Not that it is 27 degrees, right? Yeah. If it was, if it if it had said, you know, that it was 27 degrees, that's a different story. But even then, um, I wouldn't choose. 27 and 0 for Fahrenheit. That would be really difficult. Um, and the reason for that is because you'll notice here that you have a plus 32 just seemingly randomly. Um, that's probably what you want to kind of base things around, right? So what's a really easy number to use for Celsius, maybe? For the degree Celsius, what's a really, really easy number? Uh, zero. Zero. So if your Celsius is zero, what's your Fahrenheit at that point? Uh, 32. 32, right? So you got, you know, Fahrenheit of 32 when Celsius is equal to zero. Okay, so at this point, if Fahrenheit increases by 27 degrees, what's that then? Uh, 59. Oh, wait. Right, because right? you just, you know, increase by 27, which means you add 27. Okay, what's Celsius at that point? Um, 27 equals 9 over 5C plus 32. 15. Yeah, because you subtract 32, you get 27 is equal to 9 over 5C. 15. The answer is 15, because there's a 15 degree increase from 0 to, 50, 0 to 15. The easiest way to set up this question, in my opinion, right? Um, you know, if you if you actually want to work it out with an actual increase and everything, right, is to set up number one, a really easy number for Celsius, and then go from there, right? Uh, typically, this means you know your input ends up being zero, um, just because that's the number that works the easiest, and then from there you're able to you know solve the rest, right? However, you don't have to do it this way. Um, so when the question tells you that your Fahrenheit temperature is the one that's increasing by 27 degrees, right? If you take a look at, you know, how this could increase, it becomes pretty clear that the only increase that would happen is from, you know, this right here, right? Because the plus 32 is never going to change. It's always going to stay as a plus 32. So any value of increase for the Fahrenheit is all going to be, you know, accounted for right here. So, if your Fahrenheit increases by 27 degrees, well, how much would your Celsius have to change by? Well, what times, you know, what times 9 over 5 is equal to 27? 15. And you'll notice that's exactly what you saw back here. That's the, in my opinion, the easiest way to do this problem. You'll find that number 9 is pretty much the same exact question, just with some numbers that change around. All right, number 10 is actually a really good one to do. So let's do this one here. Um, so I've been so I've been seemingly told that it actually is two different Andrews. Uh so if you guys could just like maybe add on like a last name initial or something. Um like just like right click and then like rename. Um that would that would be good just for, so I can you know make sure. All right. Um and then we have guess back to Aaron. Actually, no, we have a couple of new people, right? Uh, I think Jason, I just saw you just join. Jason, you want to do number 10 here? Guess not. Okay. Um, back to Aaron and back to Aaron then, I guess. I have no idea. 
Can you stop by reading the problem? I'll help you out as we go. All right. Uh, in the xy plane above, a circle is tangent to line L. The x-axis and the y-axis, if the radius of the circle is 5, what is the value of t? Okay. So first off, um, do you know what... Are there any words in this problem that you don't understand? No. No, so you understand every single word here, right? Yeah. Okay, so what does tangent mean here? Uh, it's, told... mm -hmm. it's just side by side, right? It's like touching. Um, kind of, not really. Um, so tangent, a little bit more specifically. Um, so you know when like people say that like they go on a tangent, the idea is that um you start from a point where it's like basically the exact same. Like the idea is like when you go off on a tangent, you start from somewhere that is connected, right? But then you just yeah. go off and off and off way, way far straying away from the original topic, right? That's kind of what a tangent is as well in geometry. The idea is you start from a point of intersection and then you just never go back again. You only intersect once. So that's sort of where the definition comes from, right? A tangent going off on a tangent and, you know, like a figure of speech versus a tangent in geometry. It's kind of the same idea. You start from somewhere that's, you know, basically the exact same, in this case, a point of intersection, and then you, you know, never to be seen again, right? So a little bit more specifically, you'll actually find out that for tangents um, in, uh, you know, tangents in circles and whatnot, they actually are uh, they actually are perpendicular to any radius you can make um with the uh you know to the radius that you make with this point here so that's you know something a little bit interesting but we'll worry about that some other day this actually doesn't end up being oh, important could you use like instead of zero zero as the origin use five five and then solve using trig um like you're saying make this point right. five like make this point five five or are you saying make actually, wait, this point? never mind never mind because you don't have the angle, so you can't do it. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult to do yeah. that. However, you are kind of onto something. Um, let me ask you this. So what coordinate is this point right here? Five, five. Five, five, right? And why do you know this is five, five? Because the radius is five. Right, because you know that this distance here is five. You know that this distance here is five, right? The horizontal distance represents the x-coordinate. The vertical distance represents the y-coordinate, right? So that's why you know that this is 5, 5. Um, okay, great. Um, let me ask you this. What is the distance between these two points here? 5. 5, because it's another radius, right? Yeah. What's the distance horizontally here? Uh, to this point, what's the horizontal distance? Three. Three, right? Because five to eight is well three. Um, what kind of a triangle did I just draw? Oh, a right triangle. Yeah. So what's that height gotta be? Four. That's pretty much it. So yeah. Why is it four? Four plus five, and then so it's nine. Uh <laughs> not really. Um sixteen plus nine equals twenty-five, right? Pythagorean theorem. Yeah. Or, but um, like the the value of t would be nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah, but I was asking you more of like why is this four here for now? But yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, um, yeah. that's that's the general idea here. So it turns out that you actually have to use the Pythagorean theorem, which is also just the distance formula in a two, you know in a two dimensional surface. But that's kind of you know what goes on here. That's pretty much about it. Um, any questions here from anyone? All right, so that's pretty much it here. Um, so that's about it here for the questions that I think are really necessary in this first section. Um, so if we have a little bit of extra time, we can come back and do some more. But that's kind of the uh, couple of problems that I really want us to do here in the first tip. All right, any questions from anyone? Again, um, these are uh, actually I think there's one more page. Yeah, yeah we don't need to do these. But yeah, so these are these are just the first tip here, right? Just talking about um linear uh functions, right? And again, right, linear simply just means that it, um the highest exponent for a variable that's used is the power of one. And that's you know, you can see that you know you only have x's, right? You don't have any x squareds, 
nothing like that, right? So that's why you know it's a linear function. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much about it here. All right. If there are no questions, then we'll go ahead and move on into tip number two. Tip number two is about rate of change. Now I know rate of change seems um difficult, but I promise you, it's nothing more than simply finding the slope between two points. If you have a line, you have a constant rate of change. The slope never changes. That's the whole point behind a line, right? You have constant, consistent slope throughout the entirety of your equation. If you have a curve, if you have, you know, like a quadratic or anything higher than that, right? Um, you can't find a constant rate of change because the rate of change is constantly changing. Um, there is a way to find the instantaneous rate of change, right? But to do that would require calculus, right? Um, that's actually the whole point of calculus. The whole point of calculus is to find the instantaneous rate of change at certain points. And that's actually what you learn about in the first half of calculus. The second half of calculus goes over how to find areas, but that's a story for that's a story for our calculus class. Um, but the point here is that, you know, a more simple, more basic way of doing it is to just find an average rate of change. And to do that, you simply just take two points and find the rate of change through a line between those two points. Simple as that. So this whole section is effectively just, do you know the slope formula? That's pretty much about it. All right, is everyone here familiar with the slope formula? Everyone's good on that? If so, then we'll just go ahead and move on to, into problems. Well, guess you guys had your chance. Let's take a look at, uh, I guess, these two problems for now. All right. Um, let's see. Ben? No. Okay. Mm, yeah. Um, which one do you want to do? Problem one or problem two? It's your choice. I'll do one. Sure. What is the average rate of change from f of x equals one half x squared minus four as x changes from zero to four. Oh, also one more thing. I, I didn't ask you earlier, but is it okay if I call you Ben? Yeah, yeah, that's what I got. Okay. Um, so first plug in f of zero, mm -hmm. which is just negative four. Yeah, because you get zero squared, which is zero times one half, which is still zero, right? Yeah, okay. And then f of 4, which is 8 minus 4, which is 4. Mm -hmm. And then do the slope formula for, which is going to be 4 minus negative 4 over 4 minus 0, which is 8 over 4, which is 2. That's it. That's exactly it. Step by step, exactly all you have to do. <laughs> That's pretty much about it. Um, any questions for anyone here? Yeah, that's really it. Um, there's really no other way that you could have set this up. All right, problem number two. Uh, Brandon? No? Okay, then Edward? Um, so first plug in T1 and then T3. Okay. Can you start by reading the question? Sorry. Okay. Um, if an object is dropped from a cliff, then the distance in meters is fallen after T seconds. Um, is given by the function D of T equals 4.9 T squared. What is its average speed, average rate of change, or the interval between T1 and T3? Okay. So what you said was first plug it in into yes. those two, right? Okay. So d of 1 is equal to 4.9 times 1 squared. And then d of 3 is equal to 4.9 times 3 squared. OK. Um. So I guess my question to you right now is, do I actually have to go through and calculate what each of these two values are? Or is there maybe a little bit of a better way? All right, can you uh, go back up to the average rate of change formulas? It's just slope formulas, right? So distance in y divided by distance in x. Yeah. Okay. Difference, I suppose I should say.
Okay. Um, any ideas or a little bit stuck here? So the uh, X value, you can plug in, um, for X2, you can plug in three. And mm -hmm. then for Y2, it's uh, D of three. Right. Or in other words, the whole 4.9 times three squared, right? Yes. And then okay. X1 equals D, and then X1 is just one. And then uh -huh. Y1 is D of one. So 4.9 times one squared, okay. Yes. Um, so I guess now is a good time to ask you, why is it that we haven't actually calculated exactly what these two numbers are? Like, why haven't we just said, you know, actually just do the multiplication? Why haven't we done that, I suppose? No ideas? So the reason why you don't do that is because 4.9 times, for example, one is not that bad, but 4.9 times three squared is a little bit annoying to do, to say the least, right? So for that reason, we don't want to do that. And we can kind of save a little bit of time if we don't, right? Um, but well, how does it save time now that we're now that we're at this point? What do we do from here? Oh, can we factor? Yeah, you can, right? Um, so the idea here is this is actually an, an expanded form of the distributive property, right? If you have something in the form of a B plus a C, you can make this into a times B plus C, right? However, this one is just subtracted instead, which simply just means that it becomes B minus C instead, right? So very much the same way you can now go ahead and make this equal to, like you said, what is it now? Uh, 4.9. And then in parentheses, uh, three squared minus one. Which is equal to eight mm -hmm. over two, right? And what's that yes. gonna get you? And that, whoa. Would that be 4.9 times four? It would, which is? Which is, is that 196? One point nineteen point six. Nineteen point six. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, you don't have to do that. You don't actually have to multiply that yourself either, right? Just look. Okay, it's around five times four, which is about twenty. Well, the only extra choice you got that's near twenty is C. That's it. And that's what I was thinking, but I thought fifty instead of five for some reason. Yeah, you probably just forgot about the decimal point. Yeah, I'll do it to you. Yeah, that's about it here. Any questions here from anyone? That's pretty much about it. Um, and then in uh, in this other example here, right? You're simply just using um, you're just using the actual graph instead, and then going from there. Um, but I think overall this one's this one's not too bad. Let's take a look at our next tip first, tip number three. And again, right? If we have extra time, we'll go back and do um, you know some of the problems that we skipped over. Tip number three is about parallel and perpendicular lines. There's really just two definitions here that we really care about. Number one. Um, if we have parallel lines, what that means is that their slopes must be the exact same, right? Because if you have equal slopes, um, but different intercepts, you will never intersect. You will never have um, two points, you know, that intersect, right? Um, and the reason for that is because if your slopes are the same, that means that your rate of change is the exact same, which means that, you know, the kind of direction that they point in is the exact same, right? Um, and if you have, um, you know, the same uh, intercept, that's actually going to make you, well, have the same exact line at that point. And that's not going to be parallel anymore because it's just going to be two copies of the same line at that point. Um, and in a, in a separate sense, if you want to have perpendicular lines, it turns out that your slopes have to be negative reciprocals. So multiplicative and additive inverses, right? Or in other words, if you multiply the two numbers, they have a product of negative one. The actual proof for this is a lot more complicated. Um, and it's something that we go over in the Algebra 1 book from my memory. I'm pretty sure it's the Algebra 1 book at least. Um, but we're not going to worry about that here in this class because again, right, 
this class's purpose is not to fully teach you the material, to teach you the parts that you need to get questions correct. Um, because we just don't have the time for that. It's <laughs> simple as that. So these two are the really important details to remember. Parallel lines means slopes are the same. Perpendicular lines means slopes multiply to negative one. All right. Now that we have that, there are three problems here that we're going to do uh, two of. So between two and three, we'll do one. But let's start with problem number one. Um, James, are you good to answer here? Problem number one. If not, then Jet. Yeah. Uh, number one. So number one, right? Which of the following is an equation for a line passing through the point negative four, one that is parallel to four X minus two Y equals three. Mm -hmm. uh, so for this one, I imagine the first step would be to find, uh, convert the equation to s s the slope intercept form. Okay, so what's the point behind doing that? Why is that the first um the first thing you would do? Because that way you can because we're supposed to find something that's parallel to that equation. Mm -hmm. And then because when you convert it, then you can see that their slope must be the same and then their y intercept has to be different. Okay. Sure. So the idea here is get the slope intercept form, and then that will give you, you know, more information about uh, about the line that you're supposed to be creating, right? Okay. So um, what is that? Uh, what is that going to look like here? So how do you convert this into slope intercept form first? Oh uh, yeah. So you just subtract the four x and then divide everything by negative two, which gets you to y equals two x minus three over two. Uh huh. Because and then, it would first be negative 2y equals negative 4x plus 3. And then both of those get divided by negative 2. Good. And then, yeah, and then compare the answer choices. So the same mm -hmm. slope, it can either be A or B. Yeah, so C and D are gone. And and now how do you decide? Um, wait. Oh yeah, it has to pass through the point negative four one, right? Mm -hmm. Uh so your new equation if... is something in a format of y equals two x plus b, right? Right. So that means when x is equal to one, y must equal I mean no, x is equal to negative four, y must equal one. So you can just plug negative four in, one in becomes, yeah, one equals negative eight plus B. So B must equal to nine. Yeah, that's it. Um, a little bit, a little bit, uh, by the way, in a sense. Um, so this is the correct way to solve it. Like mathematically, this is the correct way to, you know, start with a number and, you know, get, get your answers. Right. Um, but there's a little bit of another way that you could have set this up. Um, you could have thought about this for a moment, right? Like, remember how we said, oh, uh, you have a positive slope here with a slope of two. Well, when you recognize that, think about it this way. If you have a positive slope with a slope of two, and then, you know, you have a y-intercept of negative nine, does it make sense that you'd have a point at negative four, positive one? Because it would just no. be more negative, no? Right? So if you think about it that way, on a graphical sense, A makes no sense. It has to be B already. That's another way that you could have gotten to that answer. Sound good? Yeah. Yeah, so that's just another way you could have done that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much about it. Thanks. Um, and then let's actually do number... Uh, so number three is actually another parallel question. So let's just go ahead and do number two. Um, let's see. Jason? No. Uh, then uh, Andrew? Oh, wait, which one? I guess just you. I don't know. Oh, okay. I think the other one doesn't want to answer. Oh. Uh, Which of the following is an equation for the line passing through the point negative 4, 1 that is perpendicular to 
perpendicular to 4x minus 2y equals 3. I, I, I guess I would first, like, uh, turn 4x minus 2y equals 3 into slope-intercept form. Yeah. So, again, right, same exact first step. But we've already done that before, so we'll just copy the answer here. So y equals 2x minus 3 over 2. Okay. Now what? Uh, and, well, after that, I know it has to be either A or B. Uh, okay. Um. Why A or B here? Like, what's the what's the reasoning behind it? Perpendicular, the like the fraction would need to be like flipped, and it would be negative if ours is positive. Uh huh. Uh, and then I plug in. Uh. Wait. I guess yeah yeah I would take uh. y equals uh, uh, negative one-half x and uh, plug in uh, the negative four and one for the x and y values to find the intercept. Mm -hmm. uh, and in which case I would get... Uh... Uh, I would it would be a yeah um that's uh that looks about right to me that's pretty much about it um because then this is you know two and then well you gotta subtract one from that right to get your answer of one that's it okay um any questions here from anyone all right yes sir um yeah that's uh pretty much about it number three here is just where you have to use it in um point slope form instead but nothing uh nothing terribly new at least all right um moving on into tip number four tip number four introduces to you guys two formulas number one midpoint and number two distance between two points i'm not going to go into it too much here um, but the general idea here is that for a midpoint, you simply just need to take the average of the x-coordinates, average of the y-coordinates, and that's going to be where your midpoint is. For the distance formula, it's a little bit different. Um, but I, I don't I don't really like the way that it t teaches you here. Right? I don't really like this formula. Don't really just think about it, you know, in this formula. The idea here is just if you have two points that you're trying to find a distance between, find the horizontal distance between them, find the vertical distance between them. And then that, at that point, it's simply just Pythagorean theorem, right? So you're simply just doing a horizontal distance and a vertical distance, and then finding the distance across the hypotenuse, right? Because it's just the right triangle every single time. So whenever you're being asked for a distance between two points, just think about the right triangles that get made there, right? I don't like I don't like being um, you know too dependent on formulas, right? Don't memorize this formula because you don't need to. Right? Just understand the idea that when you're finding distance between two points, it simply just means that you're just doing a right triangle. That's it. Now, um, you know, if you're told that uh, it's divided into multiple parts or whatever, right? That's when you start doing weighted averages, but uh, that's that's when things get a little bit more tricky, to say the least. Um, but yeah. So that's uh that's the general idea here. Um you can see here, you know, for this uh AP to PB ratio is you know two to three, right? Um so what that means is that P is closer to point A than it is to point B, right? Um and then the idea is well you would just you know plug in uh you know, one of your numbers is three times, one of your numbers is two times instead, and then you divide by five. That's kind of the idea behind a weighted average. Think about it as like you're taking the average of five numbers. Three of them are, you know, in this case, your whatever your A was, and then two of them are whatever your B was. And now you might be asking, why is it that I'm weighting A more than point B when you know my B has the higher number? Well, that's because the P B represents the distance from B to P, right? So if I, you know, have a number that's 40% of the way here, right? Or, you know, like if this is a two to three ratio here, well, my values are closer to here, right? So A is weighted more. That's the general idea here, at least. Um, but yeah, okay. I guess uh, 
I know, I know it's a little, it might be a little bit tricky to understand um, without seeing a couple of examples, but I guess um, any questions over what I've shown you so far? So midpoint just being an average up here, distance being, you know, just like horizontal, vertical separately, and then find the right triangle. Everyone's good with that. We have five questions here. We'll do a couple of them. Um, I definitely want to do problem number three. Um, and then apart from problem number three, we can do problem number problem number one. And I guess problem number five. Let's do these three problems here. Um, so uh let's start with I guess uh Faith. Do you want to answer a question here? Um, can I choose anyone? Yeah, any of the three here that I've marked. Okay. Um I guess I can just do number one. Sure. Okay. Um so the XY plane, the midpoint of A, B is ten four. The coordinates point A. Oh, okay. So um I think I would I'd say that so ten is the midpoint and A is five less than ten, so then I would add 10, I mean, I would add five to 10 yeah. and that's 15. So then um, I think C is the only one with- Yeah, that's pretty much about it. Um, so the the idea here is that you don't even have to actually use the, for, the formula at all, right? The idea is sure the midpoint is the average of the two, but you don't need to be looking for averages at all here, right? The idea is if point A is, let's kind of draw this out a little bit, right? So if point A is five, one, and then point B, you know, point midpoint is 10, 4. The idea is, well, the way that midpoint works is whatever dis distance this is, you just apply it again here, right? And rather than applying a direction and a distance, right? Don't do any of that, you know, really convoluted stuff, right? Just find a horizontal distance, a vertical distance, and apply that horizontal distance and vertical distance all over again, right? So the approach that you did right here, exactly correct, right? So just just apply the horizontal distance here, five, apply that onto here. That's a whole, then, you know, that's an X coordinate of 15. Well, you only got one choice now, don't you? That's exactly it. Yeah. Any questions here from anyone? That's the fastest way to do this question. All right, let's look at uh, three and five. Um, let's see. That's another full round, right? So Aaron, back to you, three and five, it's your choice. Uh, I'll do number five. Sure. So if the distance between A3 and B8 is 13, what is the value of A minus B? Um, so you would use the Pythagorean theory. And so it's 13, 13 squared equals, and so just use X squared plus uh, five squared. Okay, so, so 13 squared, that's x squared plus 5 squared, you said? Yeah. Um, What does x represent, by the way? Uh, the, the horizontal line. So the, dis, uh, the distance between a and b. Yeah, that's exactly it, right? So mm -hmm. x here represents the horizontal distance between these two points. The five here coming from the vertical distance between three and eight, right? Okay, good. And then? And then 13 squared is 169 minus five squared, which is 25 is 144. And then the square root of 144 is 12. Yeah, that's pretty much about it. Um, you could have also recognized that this is a Pythagorean triple. That would save you a little bit of time here, right? Um, you'll actually find on the SAT, they very, very often use either a special right triangle or a Pythagorean triple. We'll talk about, I think, both of these later on in this uh, in, in this book. But to kind of tell you guys right now, a couple of the most common Pythagorean triples, you saw one of them earlier, 3, 4, 5. This one right here, 5, 12, 13. 
There's one more that's pretty commonly known. It's 724.25. And this last one comes up here and there, but it is uh, 8, 15, 17. These, I think, are the most common four Pythagorean triples. There are obviously more outside of this, but these are the ones that are the most common. Now, um, you might argue and say, oh, what about like 6, 8, 10, right? Isn't that a Pythagorean triple? And to be fair, it is. However, it's not a new one. And the reason why is because it's just a multiple of the three, four, fives. So when I say the three, four, fives, five, twelve, thirteens, like these such, right? I'm referring to these and all multiples of them. I refer to all of them together. So that's uh, that's what you're seeing here. Problem number three. Um, ben, you want to do this one? Ben? Yeah. Um, okay, number three. Line segment AB has endpoints A, negative 6, 5, and B, 14, 10. If point P is on AB such that AP is to BP equals 2 to 3, what are the coordinates of point P? So first, uh, map out the points. Oh my God. Um, we could. We could. So if I say, gosh, this is a little bit large of a graph. So negative six, five is like around here. And the other one is 14, 10. So like what, here? Yeah. And we're looking at a distance there. OK. And then find the. Um... The legs, so the horizontal distance would be 20, and the vertical would be 5. Okay. For the Pythagorean theorem. Um. So you could find the Pythagorean theorem here, but um, I don't think it's necessary. Okay. Um. You don't really care about the actual distance here. That's not. That's not a huge deal. Um, so let me ask you this. Um, for point P, is it closer to A or is it closer to B? Closer to A. It's closer to A, right? And yeah. because it's a two to three ratio, A P to P uh A A P to P B, right? It's closer to point A because, well, they've got a smaller distance from there, right? So this here is I guess my point P. Okay. Um, so if this is a two to three ratio, what does that mean about the ratios of the uh, uh, the horizontal and vertical distances? Is what ratios is that going to be in? Is it also going to be a two to three ratio? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is right. So if this is a two to three ratio, then what's the what's the distance here? What's the distance here? Um, it's. It's one third of twenty. One third. Oh, two thirds. Two thirds. It's two fifths. Oh, two fifths. Yeah, half half. Because if the ratios are two to three, then one of them is going to be two fifths of the whole thing. One of them is going to be going to be three fifths of the whole thing. So two fifths makes this eight. Three fifths makes this twelve. And then over here, you're going to get two and three. Does that look good to you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then from there, right, well, if you know that your horizontal distance is 8 and your vertical distance is 2, what point is that going to be for point P? Um, two, seven. Two, seven's in the, and 2, 7 is exactly it, right? So one way that you can solve this question is by drawing a problem, drawing a picture, and then, um, you know, instead of looking at... Uh, you know, averages and whatnot, right? That can be a little bit difficult. Instead of doing that, look at the total horizontal distance, look at the total vertical distance, and then do the two to three ratios there, right? Use two fifths of the horizontal distance, two fifths of the vertical distance, and you get your answer pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's one way that works. And, you know, if it works, don't knock on it, right? Um, but let's talk about the other way that you could have done this, right? So the moment that you realize, oh, this is a two to three ratio where it's closer to you know, closer to A, further from B, the idea is, well, just multiply the coordinate for A by this number, multiply the coordinates for B by this number. 
So you get negative three times negative six times three plus uh, 14 times two all divided by five. That's your X coordinate. And then your Y coordinate is going to be five times three plus 10 times two divided by five. So the easiest way to do this, negative 18, positive 28, that's going to be 10. So this is two. And at that point, you're already done because you don't need your Y coordinate. But, you know, just in case you did, the easiest way to do this is actually go ahead and divide by five first. You get one times three plus two times two, which is seven, just like we expected. So that's another way that you could have done this. But this requires you to be very, very familiar with the concept of, you know, being able to um, do a, uh, what's it called? Weighted average, right? And that's, uh, you know, not exactly the easiest, but that's the way that we do it here. Any questions here from anyone? So just showing you guys a little bit of the variety of ways that you can do to solve a problem, right? And then lastly, system of linear equations. Um, so for a system of linear equations, you're going to have, well, first off, two different equations, right? So you're going to have ax plus by is equal to c, and then a second one, right? And the idea here is this. Number one, um, if your ratios between your a's, your coefficients of x's and coefficients of b's, right? If they do not get multiplied by the same number from one equation to the next, there's only one solution. And I'll show you guys kind of what this looks like, right? Um, if everything, right, has, if your, if your coefficients of a, a, x's and y's are the same, like, you know, if, uh, if they get, you know, multiplied by a constant value and, you know, um, but then, but then for example, uh, your C's, right, do not get multiplied by the same value, you have no solution. This is a, you know, well, no, what does that look like? How about parallel lines, right? No solutions after all, right? Um, but if the C also lines up, then that's going to be infinitely many solutions, and that's going to be the same exact line. If it looks like a slope intercept form instead, right, this is probably you know, the way that a lot of you guys are going to want to do this, just because you guys are probably more familiar with slope intercept, slope intercept form. I don't blame you. Number one, if your slopes are not the same, you have one solution, right? If your slopes are not the same, you will intersect at some point somewhere and then never intersect again, right? Um, number two, right? If your slopes are the same, but your intercepts are different, you're going to have no solution. It's going to be parallel. And if your slopes are the same and the intercepts are the same, you're going to have infinitely many solutions because it's the exact same line. <laughs> So let's look at what I mean. Um, so for now, we're going to focus on trying to keep it in standard form, right? Um, because that's probably, you know, something a little bit more new for you guys, if you guys aren't familiar with doing that. Um, I guess in addition to that, um, you know, the hard part, well, not really the hard part, but like the time consuming part of this question, like if you, you know, if you really wanted to, right, you would have to convert both equations from standard form into slope intercept form, which would just take a lot of time, right? Um, so for that reason, we don't want to do that, right? So let's look at uh, this example here in problem number one. For which of the following values of k will the system of equations above have no solution? So this is what I mean, right? So if we're looking for no solution, what that means is we're looking for the coefficient of x and coefficient of y to have the same consistent ratio. So what does that mean? Look from the top equation to the second one. My coefficients of x, one of them is 2, the other one is 4. What has happened between these two equations? I multiplied by 2. So just keep that thing going, right? Just keep that going. So instead of negative 5, multiply by 2, you get negative 10. So the answer here is negative 10, simple as that. And that is how you check, right? If they have no solution, right, it means that your coefficient of x, coefficient of y, basically from your first equation to the second equation has been multiplied by the same value. And then just double check, did you also do the same thing here? No, right? The value at the end here, the constant term did not get multiplied by the same ratio. And for that reason, it's no solution rather than infinite solutions. Are there any questions over the differences here? Everyone's good? Let's give number two a shot. Um, let's see, whose turn is it at this point? Is it back to Andrew, uh, Andrew or Aaron? Probably Aaron by now, right? Aaron, number two. 
I think I just went. Oh, you just went? Oops. Yeah. Then it's uh, wait. Did... Hold on. So, if you did you do this one? I did number five. You did number five? Okay, so then it was Ben who did number three, right, Ben? Yeah. Okay, okay. So then it's uh Ed. It's Edward's turn. Okay, Ed. Uh number two. Uh yeah, okay. So um if the system has infinitely many solutions, what is the value of A uh plus B? C can you go up to the uh, top box again? Okay, so if M1 equals M2 and uh B2 equals all right. That's that's if you have them in slope intercept form. And you don't wanna you don't wanna have to change those, do you? Like that's gonna take forever, right? Yeah. So how do you do this with the standard form? So what we saw here, right, it's very similar to what we saw over here. The idea is everything needs to be multiplied by the same number from the top equation to the second equation, right? So yes. The fact here is that it's infinitely many solutions. So does that mean the constant is also the same ratio or not? For infinitely many solutions. For here, it wasn't, right? And But that was a no solution situation. So when it's an infinitely many solution situation, it means that the constant also has the same ratio from the top to the bottom, okay? Mm -hmm. Sound good? Okay. So yes. what's the ratio from the top equation to the second equation? Uh, one to two. So you multiply by two, right? From the top yes. going down, you multiply by two. So what do you think B is equal to? B is a uh, negative four. Right. And then A? And then a? It's 10. Yeah. So A plus B is? Six. Simple as that, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's all you got to do. That's it. Any questions here from anyone? So the the moment you're told infinitely many solutions, you know that from your top row to your second row, you multiply by the same exact number for everything. Well, in this case, it's two. That's it. Um, let's do maybe two more. Um, let's say I really I do want to do number four, and then we'll do number six. Let's do these two problems here. All right, um, next up, let's hear from Jason. No? Okay, then Jet and Faith, you guys will go here. Um, we let Faith, we let you choose last time, so Jet, you get to choose here between four and six. Uh, I can do four. Okay. So in the system of equations above, A is a constant. If the system has no solution, what is the value of A? So first of all, the ratio between the two equations is three to one. Mm. So... Wait, oh, it... okay, okay. I see what you're saying. Um, not quite, because it says no solution here, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So what does that mean? When it says no solution, it means that what? It, well, actually, what what does it mean? When it says no solution. No solution. That means, yeah, they're parallel. They're parallel. Yeah, but uh. And uh, yeah. the, the ratio between. The A1, A2, B1, B2 is not equal to C1, C2. Right. So the A1, A2, so the basically the ratios of X coefficients and Y coefficients is going to match. This is going to match, but this is not, right? So we can't say that the ratio is actually three to one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. If that's the case, then A must be three. Why? Because since on the bottom equation, both um, a2 and b2 are a minus 1, and it has to be the same ratio, then a must equal 3, since those yeah, two. Yeah, 
a little bit more specifically, you can actually write this out as a over a minus one is equal to three over a minus one. Well, you know, if that's true, then don't these two just need to be the same? Same deal. It's got to be three. That's it. Any questions here from anyone? Then you'll notice that this is just a two thirds, right? Uh, one to two thirds ratio or a three to two ratio. Um, and then, you know, the C's don't line up, right? All right, number six. Okay, um, so the tickets for a movie cost $8 for adults and $5 for children if the total of 200 tickets were sold and the total amount of 1,360 was collected. How many? Okay, um, so I think we have to make a system first. Oh, a system, all right. Awesome. Uh, so let's say eight dollars for adults so like let's say a is adults and mm -hmm. c is children so eight so eight a plus five c equals um 1360 and then the other system would be um a plus c equals 200 and how many adult tickets were sold? Okay, so then to solve for A, I think um, we could, um, I think we can cancel out C by multiplying the A plus C equals 200 by negative five. So then it would, the new equation would be negative 5a minus 5c equals negative uh, 1,000, yeah. And then now we can add them together and negative 5c plus 5c cancels out. And then 8a minus 5a is 3a. And then um, we would get 360 on the other side. And then we would divide on both sides yeah. by three to get the number of adult tickets sold. Which is yeah. 120. That's exactly it, yeah. So um, do you know what this is called, by the way? Like, what is this method called? Is it called elimination? This is called elimination, yeah. Um, you could have also said, for example, C is equal to 200 minus A and then taken that and plugged in here. What, what would that be called? Substitution? Yep, those are the two methods that you can use to solve this question. Um, so anytime you have a systems of equations like this, right, um, that's what this is called. There are two primary ways to solve it. Number one with substitution, with, which is this, take, you know, this and then plug in. And then number two is elimination, which Faith showed right here, right? Um, but yeah, so it's, um, it's a topic that we didn't really discuss too much. And I'll be really honest, um, it's one that is quite important in um, Algebra 1. So if you guys aren't familiar with this, I would recommend looking up uh, systems of equations with substitution, systems of equations with elimination, and then practicing that a little bit. There's only two questions here that go over that. Um, but I will say it's a little bit easier when you have something like this. Um, I guess, Faith, one last question for you. Uh, when you have two equations that are set up like this instead, how do you solve with uh, how do you solve them if it's a system of equations? Like if both sides equal y, like, yeah, like, then I would set them equal to each other. Yeah, you just set this equal to that, right? Because if your y's are supposed to, you know, be a point of intersection between your line, that point of intersection is going to have the same y coordinate, right? So if y is the same, why can't you just set this equal to that? That's the idea. Um, so it's a lot easier in this example. You just set, you know, this side equal to that side. But when you have, you know, something like this, you'll have to do a little bit more work, right? So the general idea for this question is you have to first set up your equations and then from there solve. But that's about it here for today. So homework is going to be all the rest of the problems that we didn't do here. Um, and then uh, we'll be moving on into the next couple of tips next time around. All right. So for those of you guys um, who you know plan on continuing on this class, um, that's going to be it here for today. And for those of you guys who are you know, we're joining in to see, see what it's like, thank you. Um, but that's going to be all here. And um you know hopefully i'll see you guys next week actually and also uh one thing is this class um i think some we were planning on changing around the time a little bit so uh be on the lookout for that 
um and uh we might i i'm thinking about a saturday time but uh, we'll have to we'll have to you know uh make sure about that right um but yeah so the homework is going to be posted onto padlet um and then that's that's where you can find that all right until next time thank you yeah, thank you thank you thank you